Let the churches turn together into God's Word to Daniel chapter 6. Daniel chapter 6, one of the most uh, beloved and, and well uh, known and, and, and often taught uh, Bible um, adventures. Uh, the Daniel and the Lions then, often one we think about for kids, but uh, we often miss some of the most powerful and subtle details of those most well known stories. And uh, last week we looked at the noble brands, the, those that uh, were presented with something that was new, something that uh, was a message that uh, they had not known. And so what did they do? They, they tested it against scripture. We live in a day and age where it seems as though every day we're, we're, something new is coming at us, some new circumstance, some new situation, some new uh, uh, scenario. Uh, or even just some new thing in this world, we've got to make a decision on it. Is this going to be something that I can accept, or is it something I must deny? Is it something I'm wanting, I want to bring into my life, or keep at arm's length? We talked about that Word of God being that basis. Well, now this week, in similar fashion, thinking about this world in which we live in, and, and, and the difficulties, that as believers we face, and you know, we look at that about looking to the lens of that word. It brings about scenarios in our life where we make a stand on that word. And as a result of that, that can put us in conflict with the world in which we live. And so what is it like to, to navigate and to live, to even thrive in, in a world that, frankly, is in, becoming increasingly more hostile to the things of God? And today, of course, that already is like, ugh, you know, like that feels heavy. My hope is to remove the burden today. You know, we moved out of the, the kind of the COVID shock and experience and it felt like, you know, over the last month, it's probably been less about COVID and more about the chaos of our world. And we tend to talk about two things. And, and really up to this point for most churches, it's been easier to talk about COVID rather than to talk about the turmoil. You know, we live in a world today where you know, there's talk of destroying uh, statues and, and art that depict Jesus. There he is. You know, there's, uh, in one of the protests, there, you know, there are signs that are often put up. One, one that's particularly offensive says, if Jesus returns, we'll kill him again. There's, there's a growing sense of tension in our world and as, as uh, we move forward in this time. Uh, followers of Christ are, are uh, at times overtly or subtly put on the spot in a culture that is increasingly more and more becoming um, adversarial to the things of God. And so we come to the story of Daniel, brothers and sisters, this is not anything new. And there is not just simply hope uh, that's presented to us, but a picture throughout God's Word of God's people thriving in those times. You know, let's remind ourselves. You know, last week we celebrated, uh, you know, Independence Day, we celebrated the nation. How blessed we are that our experience hasn't been that. The brothers and sisters, that has not been the experience of most of God's people throughout history. And they have thrived. They have, they have overcome. They have lived in freedom, even in the midst of those times. When we look at a man like Daniel, we love the story of Daniel and the lion's den. And we see a man in the midst of that. I was, that's one of my favorite phrases to use. He's cool as the center seat of a cucumber. I mean, he is just, he just, even in the midst of this culture that he lived in for decades, that was adversarial with the things of God, he just lives, he just lives. And he lives free. And then we see a man who's able to, to just to rise above what's happening in the world that he lives in. The cause of the sake of his name. And so let's listen to and let's read together that all familiar story with fresh ears, with a fresh and open heart, putting ourselves in Daniel's place and seeing the world in which he lives and seeing how Daniel not only met the challenges of his age, but God, and walked with a God who more, was more than enough to meet the challenges of his day. Daniel chapter 6. Minded that Daniel was taken as a, as a young man uh, out of the tribe of Judah in exile to uh, Babylon. And now Babylon has fallen and he's under the uh, Medes and Persians. 
Let's read together Daniel chapter 6. It pleased Darius to appoint 120 satraps to rule throughout the kingdom with three administrators over them, one of whom was Daniel. The satraps were made accountable to them so that the king might not suffer loss. Now Daniel so distinguished himself among the administrators and satraps by his exceptional, by his exceptional qualities that the king planned to set him over the whole kingdom. At this, the administrators and satraps tried to find grounds for charge against Daniel in his conduct of government affairs. They were unable to do so. They could find no corruption in him because he was trustworthy and neither corrupt nor negligent. Finally, these men said, we'll never find any basis for charge against this man, Daniel, unless it has something to do with the law of his God. So the administrators and the satraps went as a group to the king and said, O oh, King Darius, live forever. The royal administrators, prefects, satraps, advisors, and governors have all agreed that the king should issue an edict and enforce the decree that anyone who prays to any god or man during the next 30 days, except to you, O king, shall be thrown into the lion's den. Now, O king, issue the decree and put it in writing so that it can and so it cannot be altered in accordance with the laws of the Medes and the Persians, which cannot be repealed. So King Darius put the decree in writing. Now, when Daniel learned that the decree had been published, he went home to, to his upstairs room, where the windows were open towards Jerusalem. Three times a day he got down on his knees and prayed, giving thanks to God, just as he had done before. Then these men went as a group and found Daniel praying and asked God for help, and asking God for help. So they went to the king and spoke to him about his royal decree. Did you not publish a decree that during the next 30 days, anyone who prays to any god or man except you, O king, would be thrown into the lion's den? The king answered, the decree stands in accordance with the laws of the Medes and the Persians, which cannot be repealed. Then they said to the king, Daniel, who is one of the exiles from Judah, pays no attention to you, O king, or to the decree you put in writing. He still prays three times a day. When the king heard this, he was greatly distressed. He, he was determined to rescue Daniel and made every effort until sundown to save him. Then the men went to went as a group to the king and said, oh, Remember, O king, according to the law of the Medes and the Persians, no decree and edict that the king issues can be changed. So the king gave the order and they brought Daniel and threw him into the lion's den. The king said to Daniel, May your God, whom you serve, continually rescue you. A stone was brought and placed over the mouth of the den, and the king sealed it with his own signet ring and the rings of his nobles, so that Daniel's situation might not be changed. Then the king returned to his palace and spent the night without eating and without any entertainment being brought to him, and he could not sleep. At the first light of dawn, the king got up and hurried to the lion's den. When he came near the, the den, he called to Daniel in, in, in an anguished voice, Daniel, servant of the living God, God, servant of the living God, your God, whom you serve continually, been able has, whom you serve continually, been able to rescue you from the lions. Daniel, the, Daniel answered, O king, live forever. My God sent his angels, and he shut the mouth of the lions. They have, no, they have not hurt me because I was found innocent in his sight, nor have I ever done anything, any wrong before you, O king. The king was overjoyed and gave orders to lift Daniel out of the lion den, den, and Daniel was lifted from the den with no wounds which were found on him because he trusted in his God. At the king's command, the men who had falsely accused Daniel were brought in and thrown in the lion's den along with their wives and children. And before they reached the floor of the den, the lions overpowered them and crushed all their bones. Then King Darius wrote to all the peoples, nations, and men of every language throughout the land, May you prosper greatly. I issue a decree that in every part of my kingdom people must fear and reverence the God of Daniel, for he is the living God and he endures forever. His kingdom will not be destroyed, his dominion will never end. He rescues and, and he rescues and he saves. He performs signs and wonders in the heavens and on earth. He, is, he has rescued Daniel from the power of the lions. So Daniel prospered during the reign of Darius and the reign of Cyrus the Persian. Let's pray. Father, we thank you 
Lord, these stories are as familiar to us as our own. This story, Lord, is, is, is wonderful and, 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 and just, Lord, it's part of the tapestry of our lives, yet, Lord, make it real, make it vibrant. Daniel was a real man who lived in a real time. Lord, make him especially real to us right now. Because we live in a real time with real issues and challenges, and we face an ever-increasingly foreign culture around us which doesn't recognize you, which even at times, Lord, is adversarial to you. And your, your son taught us that, that would be the case. Lord, help us to not be afraid. Help us, Lord, to live in the freedom of our faith and in the joy of our salvation. Lord, help us to live resolved to be a people who know their God and can live in the joy of just being yours. In the name of your son, Jesus, we pray. Amen. There's a story of, of a man who, this, is, this came from the Daily Bread, uh, one of those wonderful stories that we read often, uh, where during the summers as a schoolboy, he would go to work with his dad. And when he would go to work with his dad, his dad would always stop the same little grocery store to pick up a newspaper. And when one day, when the dad went to pick up a newspaper, without knowing that he had accidentally picked up two papers, all right, not a big deal, but when the father got to work, he realized he had accidentally picked up two papers. And of course, then the dilemma comes, what do I do? Well, maybe, maybe the father thought, I'll go back tomorrow and just pay, pay double because I accidentally took two. But he thought, no, no, I don't want... Any thought to be that, 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 I, that I took advantage of the situation or that I swiped two papers without paying one. And, and then the father was all that moment. He went right then and there, went back and returned the extra paper. And the story continued like this. It said, about a week later, someone stole money from the grocery store. When the police pinpointed the time it occurred, the grocery remembered only two people being in the store at that time. And one was my father. The grocer immediately dismissed my father as a suspect, saying, that man is really honest. He came all the way back here just to return a newspaper he took by mistake. The police then focused their investigation on the other man, who soon made a full confession. My father's honesty made a big impression on that non-Christian store owner and on me. I'm going to come back to that story in a little bit, but consider Daniel's world. But Daniel could have remembered a time in his life as a young man when things were different. He had been born in Judah, and although Judah was far from perfect, he could have remembered a time when the people of God were respected, when being a follower of the living God was a part of life and the culture, then to be taken to another culture, to another place, where not only were the things of God not respected, but often put him in conflict with the world in which he lived. And Daniel lived the majority of his life in that context and thrived. But not only that, throughout Daniel's life, there became at least <clears throat> a couple occasions, moments when there were, in a sense, purity tests. You know, would he go along with the culture? in a sinful way? Would he, would he depart from the love of his God and follow uh, the sinful things that the world was demanding that all people do? And in those moments, Daniel experienced uh, uh, the, the, the culture that demanded that each and every person capitulate to that dominant culture. And for Daniel, in this moment, the lion's den, it was, the, it was the moment, it was very similar to last week. Remember last week with the, the Thessalonians, they were all up in arms because, uh, you know, they, they feared the Christian, they, they, they were all fearful that there were these people that were on the wrong side of history because they were on the wrong side of Caesar. And in this script, in, in, in the story of Daniel, we discover that Daniel is, is, is on the wrong side of history because he's on the wrong side of King Darius. Now, we're not sure exactly what it meant when they said pray to Darius. It may have been literally God, man, Darius, that, that these people would have had a belief in, in, their, in their king being something higher. Oftentimes, in ancient world, um, 
their, their kings participated in fertility rites that they thought brought about the spring and those kind of things. And so it was very likely that, that, that they, you know, when they said pray to Darius, uh, it may have been literally to only him as a god, but it also may have been likely that because I mean, in their type of religion that the king played a role in, that he was going to be their intercessor. Like if you went to pray to your god, you had to pray to Darius, and then Darius would take care of praying to the gods. Whatever it was, it was a clear violation of scripture. It was a clear violation of what Daniel knew was the truth of, of how to follow the living God. Brothers and sisters, does this sound familiar at all? Maybe some of you can remember a time when at least the people of God were respected. In fact, many would say that they, you know, particularly of uh, those uh, of our seasoned uh, veteran Christians here in the room, can say they can remember a time in Christian culture, maybe a number of decades ago, where they would have said, you know, our culture supported Christianity. And then a few years later, the, the, the culture was tolerant of Christianity. And then a few later, a few years later, it was indifferent to Christianity. And then a few years later, it was it was. Um, you know, suspicious of Christianity, and then a few years later, critical of Christianity, and then a few years later, began to mock Christianity, and then today, openly, there are many in our world that are adversarial to our faith. Openly so. Openly so. And see the rights of Christian as increasingly diminished in our world today. Now, as we live in that world, we also see that increasingly there are more purity tests that are placed before us in terms of what we should believe based on the dominant culture, many of which are clearly violations of God's word. So how do we live in a world that doesn't look like the world we grew up in? How do we navigate in a world that, that appearingly seems to be heading in a direction and it's the wrong way. How do we live in a world where increasingly being a follower of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ is becoming more difficult? There was a 103 year old woman, um, I saw in a news article, where she said, This imagine a 103 year old woman. She had seen two, two world wars, the Depression, you know, Spanish flu, assassination of Kennedy, you know, the Korean Vietnam War. She said 2020 is the craziest year she's ever seen. There's a rain of hands right now. There is a general pessimism. About three and a half years ago, for a moment that seemed to lift over the evangelical church, but it came rushing back hard over the last month or two. This sense of pessimism about the world in which we live and the place that Christians have in it. And so how do we navigate and today, my hope through the very common and very well-known story of Daniel is how do we lift that burden from our shoulders because we see a man who doesn't live in that wringing of hands, chicken little, the sky is falling kind of way that the, the modern church has somewhat adopted, particularly in America, about the circumstances we live in. For just as much as the COVID uh, experience, I'll call it, has, has, has in some way shaken us or caused us to, to have to, to evaluate ourselves, we so have these last several weeks in terms of what's happening in our culture and our world around us. So what, how do we live? And better yet, how do we live free? As followers of Jesus Christ at a time that feels very heavy. The first thing Daniel does is he's a man of integrity. The first response of Daniel is he is a man of integrity, absolute integrity. And I think it's interesting here. In fact, that is brought up over and over again, that Daniel is a man of integrity. And I love it when there are these opponents who probably hate Daniel because he is a, a person of God. He's kind of an outsider to them. And so when he rises up to be one of those top three satraps that oversee the kingdom for King Darius, he becomes a target. And when they want to target him in this high position, what do they realize? They got nothing on him. So what is it they have to deal with? 
I, I love what it says there. It says, finally, these men said, we'll never find any basis for charge against this man, Daniel, unless it has something to do with the law of his God. And so Daniel walked in such a way that the conversation did not remain on Daniel, but it remained on his living God. And brothers and sisters, we are to live and navigate in this culture in such a way that the conversation and the, and the flashpoints and the difficulties that we face are not about us. But they're going to contend with us when they only contend with the law of our living God. I think that's such a beautiful picture of Daniel. Throughout this scripture, the, 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 the tension is not, you know, does Daniel deserve this or not? The tension is... You know, what do we do with a man that follows this God? And the conversation stays in that arena. I love the story I began with today because it was one of those pictures where even an unbeliever could see a difference. And when an accusation is made, it was dismissed. You know, I read a scripture for you last week from 1 Peter chapter uh, 3 that talks about sharing our faith and going so gently. The full context of this, it says this, it's 1 Peter chapter 3, verses 13 to 17. It says, who, who is going to harm you if you are eager to do good? But even if you should suffer for what is right, you are blessed. Do not fear their threats. Do not be frightened. But in your hearts, reveal your Christ is Lord. Always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give a reason for the hope that you have. But do this with gentleness and respect, keeping a clear conscience, so that those who speak maliciously against your good behavior in Christ may be ashamed of their slander. For it is better, if it is God's will, to suffer for doing good than for doing evil. Brothers and sisters, far too often in the history of, of, of Christians as we've been, is that we have given our, our adversaries and the enemy plenty to keep their conversation off of Christ on us. And if we're going to live in difficult times, well, we, we live in any time, but particularly in difficult times, we have to understand the roles we play. We are ambassadors of Jesus Christ. As though God were making his appeal through us, and they need to see Jesus Christ. If they're going to contend with any aspect of it, let it be Jesus Christ alone. And it is a time for God's people to rise up and to walk with God and to reject the things of a cult, the culture completely. So that when they see us, they see Christ. And they're going to contend with us, but they contend with Christ alone. And so how we speak, how we live, the choices we make, how we act and behave in relationship, how we address the, the, the struggles of our culture, even in how we evangelize, as First Peter tells us, to do so gently. That in all that we do, let us give them, let us give the enemy no foothold to take the conversation off of Christ and one ourselves. I, I read a really neat quote that said the devil has three tactics in this world. Number one, to keep people from Christ. If that fails, number two, to keep them as nominal and on the sidelines. If that fails, number three, to, to, to find a crack in their integrity as to destroy their witness. Let us give the enemy no foothold. They may lie about us. They may slander us. But let us live in such a way when they do so they're ashamed. But even they know it's a lie. And Daniel wasn't a perfect man. And no one here is a perfect man or woman. But that we would do our utmost to stay tenderhearted to Christ and to give our culture. No opportunity. Brothers and sisters, if they could find fault, isn't that what they wanted to do with Daniel? They didn't go after his God first, did they? They went after the man first because they knew if they could dismiss the man, they wouldn't have to deal with his God. And if they can dismiss you, then they don't even have to deal with Jesus in your life. That's the first. This is a time where God's people must rise up in integrity. The second thing that we see in Daniel's life is a willingness to make a stand. 
Verse 10 says, Now when Daniel learned that the decree had been published, he went home, he went home to his upstairs room where he, the windows were open towards Jerusalem. Three times a day he got down on his knees and prayed, giving thanks to God just as he had done before. He may have stand. Brothers and sisters, we live in a world where being zealous is considered a sin. It is not. Talked about a 103-year-old woman. There was a story of a man who was over 100, and they asked him, what were the keys to life? He said, moderation and everything. But then he stopped and said, no, I'm wrong. He said, moderation and everything except for your love of God. Brothers and sisters, there are hills worth dying on. There are hills worth dying on. And when I talked last week about being those noble Bereans, about knowing God's word, there are things in this life that are more important than our lives. And brothers and sisters, for Daniel, he resolved in his heart. He heard that decree. And, he's, and, 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 and put his feet solidly on the rock of God. And he accepted whatever that meant. He accepted whatever that meant. Because, brothers and sisters, as we learned from the early church, there's a joy, an honor, in suffering for the name of Jesus Christ. Now, a modern and privileged and comfortable church has lost a sense of that. But we may regain. I watched a documentary, uh, it was called uh, Lands Among Wolves 2, and it's about the church in Iran and what God is doing in that country to bring the gospel uh, in a profound way that our world doesn't even know or is even talking about. God is doing a great movement in the Middle East, and particularly in Iran. Iran being one of the nations where Christians are persecuted the most, the most overtly. There was a couple who had an opportunity to leave Iran and come to America, and they did. They went back <clears throat> because they found their life in Jesus Christ here much harder than they did there. Brothers and sisters, if we make that stand, the Lord makes it clear it's worth it. When we stand on the rock of Jesus Christ in difficult times, never is he sweeter, never is he closer, and never is he more real. <clears throat> With that being said, I give you a warning, church. There are, work, there are hills worth dying on, but there are a lot that aren't. And unfortunately, throughout the church's history, we have tended, particularly in America, to dig in our heels on hills that aren't worth dying on. Things that have to do more with self, have to do things more with our, our preferences, have more to do with our pride, have more to do with our territorialism, have more to do with our own power, have more to do with our own, with our own comfort. And the history of the American church has been largely a people who have dug in their heels with lack of forgiveness, who have dug in their heels to, to, to fight over issues that have more to do with themselves than of Jesus Christ. One of the beautiful joys of this season is the things that people are upset about or complain about aren't the things they did a year ago. There is a joyous freedom that the church has discovered. We appreciate the things of God in such a way now where, listen, we look around. Things are weird and different. And every week I've had to send you a note where things are maybe a little weirder, a little more different. And I, and I don't know, maybe you complain with each other, but I have yet to do Up. Because there's more hills worth dying on there's his time. And knowing the difference is critical. Again, no ingredients, no word of it. In essentials of unity, in those core doctrines of our belief, in those things we cannot compromise from the word of God, we will not compromise. Amen. On non-essentials, liberty, and all things charity. The final way that we see Daniel approaching this, and this is the moment, this is the point I want to teach you to. 
It's up to this point, you know, I said I wouldn't relate the burden, but I don't feel like I have. Because I haven't. Up to this point, they've been words of challenge. But now here's the word of joy. Faith. Daniel faced this situation with such faith and freedom. You almost get this picture that when Daniel read the decree of the king, he quietly just folded it up, put it down, and continued on his way. And we never see in Daniel this man who's wringing his hands. We never see in the life of Daniel a man who, who, who lives his life any different than how he would live, whether he was in Judah or he was a safe trap for the needs of Persians. In fact, this man thrived in that environment and understood the power and purpose of what God was doing. And by faith, this man lived free. Because he trusted and he believed in his almighty God. And he knew that even in difficult times, he could trust a God. He could trust a God to defend him, to walk with him, and to be with him. Brothers and sisters, we are not forsaken. We are not powerless. We are not weak. But in Jesus Christ, we are overcomers. In Jesus Christ, we are victorious. In Jesus Christ, the battle belongs to the Lord. Jeremy and I did not coordinate this. Jeremy began our service by reading Psalm 27. I, I print out, because I do the outdoor service, I, I print out a lot of my scriptures because outside the wind who knows what's going to happen. And just to, just to show you, you know, where you from, maybe you can see it, Psalm 27. <laughs> I want you to hear the words of David. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the stronghold of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? When the wicked advance against me to devour me, it is my enemies and my foes who will stumble and fall. Though an army besiege me, my heart will not fear. Though war breaks out against me, even then I will be confident. One thing I ask of the Lord, this only do I seek, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, and to gaze upon the beauty of the Lord and seek him in his temple. For in the day of trouble, he will keep me safe in his dwelling. He will hide me in the shelter of his sacred tent and set me high on a rock. Then my head will be exalted above the enemies who surround me. He goes on and says, Though my father and mother forsake me, the Lord will receive me. Keep your ways, Lord. Lead me in straight paths because of my oppressors. Do not turn me over the desires of my foes. For false witnesses rise up against me, spouting malicious accusations. I wonder if these words were again. But then here's my favorite part of Psalm 27. This is, for me, the scripture that I keep in my emergency box. Like when, when, when the floor falls out and you get that phone call or whatever, Psalm 27 is at the top of my list. And the first scriptures I go to. And it's because of this. Verse 13 and 14 says, I remain confident of this. I will see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. I remain confident of this. I will see the goodness of the Lord. But when I die, when we all get to heaven, maybe one day I'll be better to know. I remain confident of this. I will see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. Wait for the Lord, be strong and take heart, and wait for the Lord. You see, the picture of Daniel is a man who can rest in joy and live in peace, who cannot just simply survive, but thrive in a hostile culture. Why? Because the Lord is his God, and though armies besiege him, he will not fear. The war break out against Daniel alone. That's what it must have felt like. Hard enough here. Even his father and mother forsake him. He knew the Lord would receive him. 
And brothers and sisters, what's the story of Daniel? What was God doing? And what was God doing in this? Daniel had faith that God had a purpose in these times. Daniel had a faith that his God would be with him. We remember this, the words of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in the same book, in a similar time. Who were triumphant knowing that their Lord would save them, but even if he didn't, they would not bend the knee. Why? Because they so trusted their God. This is just a picture of being a follower of Jesus Christ as a believer. Chicken Little, the sky is not falling. When Jesus spoke of the end times, what did he say? Lift up your heads for your redemption is near. There are two types of believers who deal with this. In our world today, there are a lot of people who, who, who I me. Mean, I talk about unbelievers. You know, where else do they have to turn? Of course they're going to capitulate to the culture. Of course, when the world says jump, they'll say how high. And sorry I didn't do it well enough or I didn't do it 20 years ago. We have corporations that are literally falling all over themselves trying to figure out what will make anyone happy right now, right? And just begging the world, just, just please don't be mad at us right now. And there are many people who say more and more but don't know Jesus Christ and are doing the same thing. And then there are those who make that stand, who say that Jesus Christ, I will not back down. But even amongst those, there are two groups. Even amongst those who say, I make my stand on Jesus Christ, there are two groups. One of those that look like them and live in peace, who because of the cause of Jesus Christ are not wringing their hands and not fearful at the days to come, but actually are waiting on the Lord, confident that they'll see the goodness of the Lord in the land of living, confident that God will use these times for greater things than they could ever ask or imagine or believe. And then there's another group that's walking around there. Absolutely paranoid. The evangelical church, and it's going to speak very plainly, we always struggle with that. We deal with a certain level of paranoia. Bringing our hands over the days that God has ordained for us to live in. And brothers and sisters, there's nothing wrong with looking to signs of the time. There's nothing wrong with being aware about what's happening in the world. There's everything wrong with allowing those things to take us away from our faith in Jesus Christ and bring us to fear. In fact, the stories of the major and minor prophets that speak of the end times and the millennial kingdom and the coming of the Messiah and his return, and that beautiful book of Revelation were given to God's people not to cause us to wring our hands, but as Jesus said, to lift up our heads for our redemption is near. But and sisters, the Lord has lied to us and made us believe that the return of Christ is to our detriment. Right? How many of you ever watched the movie when they talk about the apocalypse or the end? It's a picture of evil winning. And we as largely as the church have adopted that narrative. But sisters, that's a lie. The end times are Satan's final gasp from one of the greatest revolutionary evangelistic moments in world history where Christ will utterly, completely, and totally crush evil and bring about the victory for all who believe in him. And it's a time we abandon this paranoia, paranoia that has saturated the church and turn those things to joy, to confidence. Because of our faith in a God who has won, has already won. And it's time for us to live in that victory today. Amen? Amen. Brothers and sisters, this is a word of hope. Because, brothers and sisters, this is not anything new. Imagine for Daniel how it seemed impossible for anything to change. Yet God said, don't give up hope on that. I'll see the goodness of the Lord in the land of living. Listen, we don't know the times that God has set. And we don't know the ways in which he will work. Could anybody have imagined that the Lord would have used this situation with Daniel to set up a decree that the God of the universe would be known to these somewhat or often very wicked people? Who at one moment were against the things of God. Now God destroyed his, the enemies of Daniel and destroyed the enemies of God and used this to actually turn the story on its head could God not do that today? Have you read the book of Judges? 
Have you read and understood the history of God's people? Satan, every time he squeezes hard, more sand slips through his fingers. And oh, how he is squeezing very hard today. Brothers and sisters, I can guarantee you that it will bring about more and more people escaping his grasp. <clears throat> We're a part of that. And so, brothers and sisters, let's abandon that fear. And let's live in the joy of Jesus Christ now. This is a gift. This is a gift, and every day is precious. As I look over this scripture today, let's be a people of integrity. Let's keep the story. Let's keep the let's keep the conversation with Jesus, not us. There are things worth making a stand on. There are things that are not worth making a stand on. Daniel lived his life knowing when to call that shot. Make sure we know the same time too. Don't miss that moment. But don't. For wrong reasons, create the wrong moment. You get what I'm saying? But then finally, let's live free in our faith. Let's live free in the reality of Jesus Christ. Let us lift up our heads. For our redemption is not only here, but it is secure in Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you. This is a time for great joy. And Lord, I know that for myself, one who loves politics, who loves to watch the news, who, 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 finds, uh, who finds myself often talking and walking down those dark, dark scared uh, stairways of, of speculation that I don't need to. But I can live in the moment of the joy of Christ, knowing that I will not simply <laughs> survive that I will not only simply make it, but I can thrive in Jesus Christ. And like Daniel, live in a time when what God is doing is greater than my own life and find joy in that. Father God, it is greater, it is better to live in a difficult time and experience great faith than to live in a mediocre time and experience a mediocre faith. So just help us to just, just even as we model to our young people, As we model to our young people, or they may see an example in us of just joy in Christ that overwhelms the circumstances. Lord, 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 help us to stop feeling sorry for ourselves. Help us to stop wringing our hands. Help us to take hold of you with all of our might, trusting you completely and totally for everything. Knowing that, Lord, even if the army besieged you, even if war break out against me, my heart will not. For you, Lord, are my fortress. You are my rock. You are my salvation. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. As we stand together, let's let's close.